friends. How about we build another diorama, this time situated in the present day, hmm? What I have in mind here is an industrial backyard where volunteers try to restore or disassemble old rusted out tanks, situated somewhere in the UK, and no, that's not some terrible fanfiction, I'm loosely basing this scene on real photographs. Well, as you can tell already, it's gonna be a pretty large scene, all because the Conqueror Mark II, the main protagonist of this anime, is a hefty tank. A diorama of this size is a good excuse to use some kind of building as a backdrop, and as with all my projects, it's gonna be completely scratch built from styrofoam. Actually, if you're chiming in just now, I posted two videos about it, how to carve and sculpt the main structure from styrofoam, how to paint the cinder blocks and faded plastered walls, and then, in the second video, how to make windows, the roof and all the other elements. The warehouse itself is inspired by a real building that's situated in a nearby village, even though I don't live in the UK, so I was able to get some pretty nice reference pictures for the thing. So that's the warehouse finished, again, if you wanna see the process in detail, check the previous two videos, and now we're gonna focus on the groundwork, or rather the concrete work. You can't spell concrete work without cork, and that's gonna be the main ingredient here. I'm sourcing it from these kitchen plates as they're cheap and easy to get. Cork has many benefits, the first one probably being that it makes your diorama look cozy. <laughs> but okay, seriously, it's durable yet easy to cut. I've cut it into 3cm wide strips and then cut those into 7cm long concrete slabs. It can be sanded pretty easily, so you can quickly get rid of any sharp edges but also add small cracks and imperfections. I only needed one of those kitchen plates to cover the entire diorama, and now comes the real fun part, adding some gnarly concrete texture. The main ingredient here is white acrylic putty for wood, but any kind of white acrylic putty would work. These two work as a system of sorts, because on one hand, cork has its characteristic texture, and we're using the acrylic putty to hide it, while also creating a more authentic texture by stippling the putty. On the other hand, the cork texture makes it very easy to form realistic cracks in the surface, and this is seriously the most enjoyable part. However, it's not just about large cracks. As you're bending the sheet in all directions, small flakes of the acrylic putty will fall off, creating a super realistic effect of eroded concrete. We'll make all of this sweet texture pop with paints of course, and if it doesn't look gnarly enough, we can always add more putty in limited amounts and smooth it out with a flat sheet of plastic. With these techniques you can make each slab look different, hugely improving the visual appeal of the diorama. The slabs must fit perfectly into the scene. Cutting them to shape is easy as you just have to draw a line from the other side, using the sides of the diorama as a guide. Then you just make a precise cut and you're ready to go. I would also advise making sure they are glued perfectly flush with the base, as it will make your life easier while laminating the scene. But let's now admire the concrete surface for a moment. This is the first time I'm creating such a large surface with this material, and it was seriously more enjoyable than regular terrain. But that was probably because it was something new. <laughs> and speaking of terrain, I left off this small portion on purpose to give the base some variation. For now I'll just cover it with VMS Smart Mud, the best terrain sculpting material out there, and from now on you can buy this and anything else you might need through Michigan Toy Soldier Company with a discount if you use the promo code MOTFRIENDS2022. <laughs> and now, with the basic surface finished, we can finally make the scene really presentable by laminating the sides. As always, I'm relying on my favorite 0.4mm thick wooden veneer. It's a very sturdy material, but still pretty easy to cut. Usually I just make a few passes with the hobby blade and then break the sheet off. It saves you time and hobby blades. Double sided tape is a smart way of attaching the veneer because unlike PVA glue, it doesn't warp the thin wood. And the bond it creates is immediate, which means it's ideal for laminating round or oval bases. Once that's out of the way, I trim the excess wood around the edges and sand them flush. I like my bases more when the edges are slightly rounded, and for that I use a carpenter's sanding sponge. I always make the wood slightly taller than the base. 
This way I can carefully trim it so it will cover every terrain feature precisely and nothing more. And because it's so thin, it doesn't feel as distracting as thick sheets of balsa wood, which are usually 0.6mm and thicker. Blending the sides with regular groundwork is easy. You just smear more smart mud over the wood. On the concrete slabs, here I resorted to lightweight acrylic putty, which is another awesome sculpting medium. Filling the tiny gaps was easy, but I also had to add the concrete texture, and this was quickly carried out with the acrylic putty. Okay, this looks absolutely sweet. Nothing is stopping us now from having heaps of fun with the more interesting techniques. And check it out, precise work always pays off, and the building fits in its place like a glove. Let's now add the actual groundwork, as in the top layer of soil. To start things off, I filled the gaps between concrete slabs with real earth from my garden, trademark. You don't want to sneeze during this process, at least until you fix it in place. To do that, I soaked the earth with lacquer thinner. You can use alcohol, but I'm too lazy to pour it into a dropper bottle, so I went with Mr. Leveling Thinner. But the point is, it breaks the surface tension, and then you can very efficiently pour diluted PVA glue over the surface and it'll nicely spread everywhere. It's usually a very wet and sloppy process, and if the surface is large enough, it allows you to add even more texture by sprinkling additional dirt on top of that, which by the way also speeds up the drying process. When it was all rock hard, I added some more dirt on the concrete to blend it more with the ground. This will also serve as a bed for some unkempt vegetation and tall grass. And that's gonna be my standard approach, although in limited amounts. You start with small blobs of PVA glue, preferably very thick, straight from the bottle, and then you hit it with a static grass applicator. I like to work in small sections because the process feels more controlled that way, and I always start with the shortest length that covers the biggest area, slowly working my way towards longer strands, you know, giving the grass more variation. The color itself isn't important at this stage because I always spray it with an airbrush. As such, I can use any suitable material without worrying about its color. For example, large paintbrushes are a great source for long strands of grass. Okay, <laughs> mine has been pre-painted during one of my previous projects, but it doesn't really matter that much. The point is to apply the grass in multiple levels, starting with the shortest undergrowth and finishing with long tufts here and there. To be honest, this time I somehow ended up with pretty nice raw colors in the grass, but I still went over it with an airbrush. Priming it with Mr. Mahogany Primer provides us with a good shadowed undercoat. This is very important because it will make the finished grass look denser and more lively. And here are some of the benefits of painting it. You can, for example, add lots of subtle variation. I like to start with dark yellow for those dry strands here and there. Once everything is yellow, I apply vivid green tones in random patterns. This way you can achieve color variation on individual strands. For example, the bottom can be fresh and green while the tips are gonna be dry. And that's hard to achieve with unpainted static grass. And also, I like to make the green lighter and lighter, spraying it in more and more controlled amounts for that nice three-dimensional effect. There's always a lot of green overspray all over the place, so it's always best to start with grass, and then, as you're painting the groundwork around it, you're also fixing all those unwanted spots of green. However, for the purpose of this diorama, I had to paint the ground in two stages, the first one being the concrete. I wanted a relatively light, warm tone that would act as a good base for acrylic and enamel washes. To get this result, I mixed various earth-colored Tamiya paints, always adding a drop or two of German grey, and all of a sudden, the texture is beginning to pop. To get the most out of that sweet texture, I painted each slab with different acrylic washes. Contrary to popular belief, only one grey paint was used during this stage, and the majority of the work was done with warm earth colors such as light mud, old wood and deck tan from Vallejo. Pure white was added selectively on some panels to add more contrast and tonal variation. The main advantage of having a relatively pale base coat is that you can always make it darker, and this means you sometimes have to plan a few steps ahead, and in this case, I knew that I'd be adding lots of dark colored washes. 
more specifically German black brown from Vallejo to emphasize that rough, cracked texture of the concrete. Sometimes I waited for the previous light washes to dry, and sometimes I applied the dark wash using the wet blending method, aka letting it seep into the previous paint that was still wet. All of this was just messing around and slapping one paint over the other, but the real kicker is this, using medium grey from AK to highlight the raised texture. This was the most time consuming process and I have to speed it up for you to make it easier to see and understand, but it's basically chipping for concrete. You just don't have to use a super fine pointy paintbrush and the paint can spill over the surface a little, so it's not an extremely precise job, thank goodness. And the result, well, it looks very neat, to be honest, and the difference between textured and untextured slabs is like night and day. You can easily add more interest by varying the intensity of each panel, and that's actually very easy as well, because it's the texture we created previously that acts as a roadmap for us. We just have to pick it out and follow it with a paintbrush. And now we're getting to the second stage, painting the earth. I didn't want to spray everything all at once and then treat each element with a paintbrush because it would result in a huge mess. For example, the heavy acrylic washes would spill into the patches of dirt and that would be no bueno. Diluted buff from Tamiya is one of the most universal colors for dioramas, as you can use it to base coat pretty much any type of terrain and then add more variation with washes. But also, as I learned not so long ago, it's good to leave some of the original earth colors visible. If possible, of course, as it makes the whole process much easier and saves you time. And now we're getting to the final and best part, adding enamel washes. This is one of the biggest advantages of cork over styrofoam, because the foam would completely disintegrate if you even touched it with mineral spirits. Cork, on the other hand, is indestructible, so you can safely blend enamel washes on top of it. In fact, you can absolutely soak it with the stuff. That's no joke, because cork is also a very absorbent material, and sometimes I had to pre-moisten certain slabs with enamel thinner, and only then I could start adding washes in a controlled manner. I used earth from ammo to add more color variation to the dry dust zones, and winter streaking grime from AK for those deep shadows, stains, and to bring out the cracked texture even further. So. That's the groundwork finished, and I think it looks pretty nice. It has lots of different textures, it's not overly dark or boring, and it complements the old warehouse. Um, let's now do something completely different. Figures. And let me tell you, this diorama calls for a very specific set of fine gentlemen. The most suitable ones I could find in my stash are these German mechanics from Panzer Art. Sadly, I didn't have the time nor skill to convert them into full-fledged civilian mechanics, so I had to make them look civilian the only way I know. With paints. <laughs> First of all, instead of my usual black and white pre-shading, I went with black and deck tan for those warmer, more natural highlights. Painting was carried out with glazes, the quickest way to achieve good results. I'm a very slow painter, but thanks to this method I can finish one figure in roughly 6 or 7 hours. To paint a figure with this method you need to apply several layers to build up the opacity, while also keeping the underlying lights and shadows visible. That alone doesn't really cut it, so I always outline every seam line, pocket, and all the other details you can find on figures, with diluted black-brown. While I'm at it, I also emphasize the shadows with the same color, because it'll make the figure look much sharper. Sometimes I also sharpen the highlights, but it's not always completely necessary. It depends on the figure. But picking out details in a lighter color makes them stand out even further, making every detail nicely visible. Now, skin tones can be tricky. So far I only painted faces and hands, so it was only logical that a bare-chested chap was very intimidating to me. Andy, one of my patrons, has been painting figures, including the skin tones, with an airbrush, and he was nudging me to try it out for a while now. This seemed like the best figure to give the method a try, and I used the same colors I normally use for brush painted skin. Brown sand for the base tone, flat flesh and basic skin tone for highlights. Spraying Vallejo acrylics isn't easy, but I reduced them with VMS acrylic thinner and it worked pretty well. A little flat if you ask me, but a good foundation for brushes. Luckily, 
the techniques were now the same as when I paint faces or hands on figures. And interestingly, most of the heavy lifting was done with raw umber from AK, a dark brown paint diluted heavily with tap water and some drying retarder which I carefully brushed into shadowed areas. Of course I also emphasized the highlights, basically I painted the head and the torso simultaneously. It was just a larger area to work on, but the techniques were the same. It's honestly, yeah, it's an interesting approach, very useful if you need to paint a lot of figures quickly, or if your chaps have bare chests, so let's say a set of US Marines in the Pacific. Overall, these can be considered an exercise in painting historical figures in the most historically inaccurate way possible. <laughs> Not great, but good enough for my purposes. Okay, so now I have every major element of the diorama finished. This means I can start putting it all together while at the same time adding more stuff because a yard like this calls for some junk and clutter. But first things first, the building can be now glued and bladed in. Just a bit of PVA glue on the cork base and a bit of alignment with a straight metal edge from the other side. Once the glue dried, I filled the tiny gap with lightweight acrylic putty. One of its benefits is consistency. It's more of a foam, which means it doesn't make a huge mess, and you can easily smooth it out with your fingers. I prepared some accessories in advance. A welding station from Miniart comes from their field workshop set, and I also 3D modeled and printed some additional bottles. You can actually download these amongst other details on my Patreon page. An industrial yard doesn't have the proper vibe without wooden pallets, does it? As it turns out, these are very easy to make by yourself. The 0.4mm veneer is excellent for making thin, sturdy planks, and the wooden blocks were chopped from a strip of balsa wood. I used my tried and tested approach for painting faded wood. A generous coat of black primer penetrates the wood, making it less absorbent, and then, after covering the entire surface with black brown from Vallejo, I added a bunch of acrylic washes. Starting with old wood, which dries to a nice, desaturated finish if there's a dark base coat underneath. Then another heavy and random coat of Iraqi sand combined with light mud on some planks, because, you know, old wood usually fades into light, grayish tones. To add some visual interest, I painted one of them in chipped blue paint. This can be quickly done if you let the brush skip over the surface. No chipping fluid is necessary here. Metal details were also painted using my standard methods. Base coated in various Tamiya paints and weathered using a combination of acrylics and enamels. Washes using winter streaking grime and streaking rust effects, and of course, detail painting with acrylics. I also used diluted light mud from Vallejo to blend these accessories with the ground, creating a subtle dust gradient towards the bottom. Everything was then super glued to the base, and I even found a good use for the leftover track links from the Conqueror. They'll be nicely stored right next to the tank. The trickiest part here was adding and painting the welding hoses. I made them from 0.6mm lead wire, carefully super glued them in place, base coated with black brown, and then painted them in their respective colors. Not fun, but worth it. The final touch is always painting the wooden sides with a flat black color. So far, I've been using Tamiya acrylics for this, but why spend those when a regular household paint does the job as well? And not just that, a regular large brush does the job equally as well, but in a fraction of the time. Now I could just attach the turret and finally consider this huge project finished. But friends, this was one of the least expected and most escalated dioramas I've ever done. What started as a shelf queen conqueror from Dragon that I didn't want to finish, like, ever, <laughs> in fact I considered just throwing it in the trash, became a very refreshing project because I could finally try painting a heavily rusted out hulk of a tank. And because that alone wasn't enough, I wanted to make a simple scenic base for it. However, the tank's size and shape, especially the long gun barrel, called for a large base, and a large base with a lot of empty space is a good excuse to put a building behind the model. And then it just evolved into this massive, rather complex diorama. It would be all good and fun if I wasn't creating this whole scene in a very... Um, limited conditions, and I wasn't able to invest as much time into it every day as I would like or as I usually do, which is unfortunate, but is the way it is. 
My house remodeling project is still ongoing, but luckily the contractors left this week so I can finally have some peace again. But I still have a lot of work to do. Actually, if anyone enjoys assembling a kitchen from Ikea, just let me know, I might have a job for you. <laughs> but hey, what I'm trying to say is that I'll choose my upcoming projects more carefully so I won't lose my mind. The next model will be something simpler and smaller. So I'm thinking a 148 or even a 172nd scale model. And hopefully, with like 80% certainty, the next video will come out the next week, because at the moment, it just nothing is certain on my end. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and hopefully learned something new. Thank you for watching, my friends, and thank you to my awesome patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing, want to get more of it, and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of reward would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails, I'm posting one week early ad-free videos and that means a new model, and I also have some small 3D models for detailing your projects. Also a bunch of references from the real world, if you need inspiration for old buildings, landscapes and so on, and last but not least, these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. Alright, but friends, I'm definitely not building another huge diorama as long as things are crazy here, and I guess there's a bit of wisdom in that, because if your life is busy, a large project can take you forever to finish, so it's a good idea to choose your projects carefully. Anyway, you all stay safe, stay awesome, build your models, don't just collect them, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!